House lawmakers approve more money for schools and teachers. The intent of this is to make this long lasting. Uh, this is intended to fix the problem for a very long time. We'll take a deeper dive into how the plan works and how it could change. And the push to give Texas farmers a new cash crop. You just watch. There's going to be more hemp grown than we could ever process. How the Agriculture Commissioner and lawmakers are working together to reduce restrictions on hemp and CBD oil in Texas. Hello and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Lawmakers in the Texas House approved a bill to overhaul how the state pays for schools. It provides $9 billion in school funding, more money for each student, and mechanisms to lower property taxes. But it sets up a potential conflict with the Senate over how much to pay teachers. Long lines of students on field trips shuffled through the Texas Capitol Wednesday. In the rooms above them, elected officials laid the groundwork for their schooling in the years ahead. This day is uh, emotional for me in many ways. Um, as I walked onto the House floor this morning preparing to vote for this historic school finance reform, I was thinking about the students that I used to teach um, back in San Antonio. We are finally uh, reforming public education in the state of Texas and not by court order. At the end of the day, what really matters is that, okay, when you get done with all the math, everything, all the moving pieces, how much more is there? Right now, the cash-strapped school finance system takes millions of dollars from property-rich schools like Round Rock. Instead of sending the $51 million Round Rock taxes to other districts, under this house plan, they'll send zero. And next year, they get 500 more per student. A rising tide raises all ships. That includes teachers, thanks to an amendment requiring school districts to use some of that extra money for raises. I think it's important that we raise teacher pay because I want to see a day uh, when more more people are interested in going into the field of education. As part of Wednesday's debate on the House floor, lawmakers approved an amendment where any time the amount of money per student increases, salaries of teachers and full-time staff would too. It's different than what Senate lawmakers approved, which was a $5,000 across the board pay raise annually for teachers and librarians. And that's going to be a starting point for the two chambers to look at. Then it simply becomes an issue of trying to ensure that there are enough dollars going into the system to guarantee some pay raises, which are very needed for our state's teachers, in addition to being able to reform the finance system, which is desperately needed as well. The plan that passed the House will see some changes in the Senate, but Speaker Dennis Bonin sounded optimistic about finding common ground. And we expect them to pick up House Bill 3 and do what happens in this process, and that is put their take on school finance on it, and they should, because that's what we would do. It's what we've done. And then we go to conference and we resolve the differences and we deliver success for the people of Texas. Next stop for HB3, the Senate Education Committee. For perspective, we turn to our panel. Elias Wavy covers the education for the Texas Tribune and James Berrigan is the state government reporter for the Dallas Morning News. Welcome. Thank hey you. Josh, thanks for having us. Sure, so passing HB3 seems to be a big deal. But we've heard about this for session after session after session the need to fix the school finance system. Um, is this really something that is going to work this time, you think? It's hard to say. You know, last session you saw um, the House also passed a, a school finance reform bill, um, you know, around this time last session, um, and then it sort of got held up in a stalemate with the Senate um, over uh, private school choice measures. So um, I think this time around there's more money available um, there are more people saying that they want to do school finance reform and property tax reform, um, but you, you just never know toward the end of session exactly what stalemates um, are going to happen and, and you know what's going to hold up certain bills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two points to that. Um, I, I think it's great that we're pumping the brakes and saying, hey, the House also got their bill <laughs> last time around in, in 2017, and they got their bill out early, and then it went to the Senate, and, and then the compromise didn't happen. And compromise, as you know, has become a, a, a bad word in the Texas legislature over the last couple of sessions. I think this year we're seeing something very different because the big three, Speaker Dennis Bonin, uh, Governor Greg Abbott, and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, all are on board saying public education is the big thing we need to get done. And there's also pressure from the voters. I think we saw in the 2018 elections that voters want the school, uh, the, the, the public education system in Texas to get fixed. Um, and property taxes, which is, which is part of the, the school finance system formula here. Um, so I think there is possibility for compromise. I think there's a willingness to compromise. Um, but just, you know, where we're going to end up on it, uh, that's, that's what we're waiting to see. And we have to wait till the Senate 
uh, comes up with their plan before we can even start uh, seeing where the pieces are going to move. You mentioned uh, the one amendment earlier, but we know there were 92 amendments in total, and a lot of the members were kind of gearing up for a really long night, but it didn't really take that long. Um, what do you think kind of was the key to keeping things going? Yeah, I think there was a lot of negotiation before we even got to the floor on Wednesday. Um, you know, there was sort of convincing people to take their amendments down if they if it didn't, um, you know, drive with what the, the speaker and, and Representative Huberty wanted for the bill. Um, if it would add, you know, additional costs to the bill that would make it untenable moving forward with what they proposed in the budget, or if just politically it would tank the bill entirely and, and uh, sink its chances of, of getting voted off. I, I think, um, uh, you know, I was joking with people uh, about how long we were going to be there, and somebody said, we might be out of here by dinner time, and we actually were. Um, so I think that tells you just how badly everybody wants to, um, at least on the House side, be on the same page um, in terms of this bill and, and get out, you know, what they call a clean bill, so that that's politically um, expedient, that you can move through it. Um, Aaliyah mentioned uh, earlier the um, school vouchers, which did not come up in this uh, session at all, in this discussion. I mean, I, maybe it would have come up a couple of times, but really has not been a major issue, which was a sticking point for the Senate last session. We've not heard those conversations, so if you're talking about compromise like we were earlier, I think that's one issue that you, you know you go in and you're a little bit more hopeful that they can actually get something done because school vouchers, which was a sticking point for the Senate, has not been a subject of conversation. What you did see on on the floor um, in terms of debate back and forth um, was around you know would this actually provide property tax relief um, for a lot of hardline conservatives? That's what they're they're running on. That's what their base really cares about. Um, there was a, you know, a debate between Representative Huberty and Representative Matt Schaefer, who's part of the, the Freedom Caucus, um, we're part of those uh, hardline conservatives, and you know, he really questioned him on how would this actually um, provide property tax relief long term. I don't think he was ultimately uh, satisfied f uh, with the answer for long term relief, um, so you see that tension there and you see what might come up uh, with the Senate in the future, but uh, it was enough for him to vote on the bill, at least for immediate tax relief. And I think one other thing is that, you know, the speaker, f from the moment he became speaker, said public education. Uh, that's, that's what this session is going to be about. And then when we all marched into his office and had uh, on the record interviews uh, before his first day as speaker, uh, he told us public education, public education, public education. That, that is his number one, two, and three priority. So I think a lot of the credit has to go to him in terms of advocating for this, putting this on the front burner, and saying this is what we're going to get done. Um, so now it goes to the Senate, and we'll see, we'll see what they bring forward and where they can compromise, I think. And we'll have the same conversation in a few weeks then. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The Senate gears up for a battle over how to control property tax growth. We'll hear from one senator with a unique perspective on the promises and pitfalls of tax relief. I think they'll feel that they're turning their pain into purpose. Mothers who almost died after giving birth share their stories. It's personal for one lawmaker, how she's fighting for change. Mothers who almost died after giving birth, sharing their stories, and now pushing for change, they believe what happened to them could have been prevented. Our investigation highlighted problems with not only data collection, but also tracking of maternal deaths. And now a state lawmaker wants to make sure stories of near misses are not forgotten. She testified Wednesday at the Capitol. Arzo Dost has been tracking her bill and breaks down how it could change the way the state tracks maternal health. Why mothers are dying or barely surviving childbirth is personal for state representative Sean Theory. This bill is really a game changer. She testified about her bill, which would create the first statewide online maternal data registry. It would collect and store data from hospitals and other health care providers on deaths and near misses. So we have an opportunity to catch it before it happens. A KXAN investigation found the numbers are not clear because of errors with data collection. The state created a new method that focuses on tracking numbers, but women who die more than 42 days after giving birth are not included. Deary says her bill will improve overall tracking and include women who survive complications. For every single maternal death you see, there are hundreds if not thousands of other kinds of complications that don't get recorded, and these women are just as important as the ones that we're focusing on. 
but not everyone is on board. We worry that the legislation as proposed includes many metrics that have not been tested or, or proven as improving maternal health outcomes. Deary says the bill is critical. Um, the fact that I almost lost my life in childbirth, um, it wouldn't be in vain. And all of the, the wonderful young ladies um, that lost their lives and their families, they, I think they'll feel that they're turning their pain into purpose. The Public Health Committee will now consider this bill. I'm told they could make a decision as early as next week. That was Arza Dose reporting. Catch up on our complete coverage right now on your station's website. Just search for Mothers Erased. In the story, you can see the submissions from Texas mothers pushing for change in their video diaries. You can also watch the full investigation as well. It's all available in the Texas Politics section of your station's website. People in the Capitol and in control of the Capitol think they may know better when they really don't. The battle over property tax reform will play out in the Senate next week, and one lawmaker has a warning about how the plan could affect your local government. And people who want to reduce restrictions on hemp and CBD oil get a key ally, how that could help a green gold rush to Texas. We've seen progress on school finance from the Texas House. Now the Senate is preparing to take on the challenge of property tax reform. Senators are scheduled to vote Monday on Senate Bill 2. That bill limits property tax growth by putting a 2.5% cap each year on how much taxes can rise. Anything above that level would require voter approval. Right now the cap is 8%. Joining us for perspective is Senator Kirk Watson, a Democrat from Austin. Welcome. Thank you. Please be here. So property tax reform is a big priority this session. Uh, Senate Bill 2 is coming up. Uh, city leaders are um, really kind of worried about what that would do for the property tax cap, right? Well, so, yeah, Senate Bill 2 has a lot of, of, of moving parts in it, and, and property tax reform needs to happen. Uh, one of the big issues, though, with property tax reform is that the state uh, has become so overly reliant uh, on, on local property taxes to fund the state's obligation for the public school system. And so there's, there's been this effort, I think, to some degree to distract from the state's failure to do right by what it ought to be doing and instead try to point the finger at others like local, like cities and, and counties. So as, as this debate goes on, the question is, what do we do to make sure that our locally elected officials, our mayors and councils, our commissioner's courts, get to make the decisions they're elected to make uh, by, by the people in elections that are very important uh, and just as important as anybody in that legislature got elected by on how they're going to fund police and fire and EMS and parks, playgrounds, libraries, things of that nature. Now you have a unique perspective because you were the Austin mayor. Right. How do you see fixing this without uh, actually hurting city services? Well, that's what I worry about. Um, as I was su su suggesting just a minute ago, uh, the elect, we elect people at a local level. We elect a mayor and a council. and We elect a county judge and commissioner's court for a reason. We want them to make the decisions about how we want to live uniquely in a place like Austin, Texas or, or Travis County. And we want them to make the decisions about how our quality of life is going to be impacted, how many police officers and sheriff's uh, deputies we're going to have. And so I, I really worry that People in the Capitol and in control of the Capitol think they may know better when they really don't. Now this property tax discussion is really tied to school finance. Absolutely. Which has been a big, big topic this session, but there's some big differences between the way that the House wants to tackle that and the way the Senate wants to. Yes, and, and, and the Senate, one of the, one of the concerns I've had about the way the Senate has been doing things is it, it talks about wanting to provide property tax relief. And again, as I suggested a minute ago, the biggest player in our rising property taxes has been the state's overdependence on those property taxes, uh, particularly in a place like the Austin Independent School District. Uh, with recapture and with the formula, uh, as you know, if property values go up so that property taxes increase, the state's share of the funding for public schools actually goes down. So that with this reliance that the state has on local property taxes, right now the, 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 the state is paying less than 40% of its obligation for public schools. Now, 
the problem that I see right now is the, the Senate, while it talks about wanting to, the, those in control keep talking about how they want to have uh, a property tax relief, what they're not saying is how they want to pay for things. So there's a lot of faith that's having to go into this. The House has moved more quickly. Uh, the House actually passed a bill this week uh, dealing with school finance. The Senate's uh, version of that uh, is yet to be really, really been, the blanks been filled in. Now also, um, this coming week, the Senate is scheduled to vote on a bill you've really pushed to make sure that people understand where their elected leaders are, what, what they're actually doing, and yes. tell us about 1640. Well, the, we, I have a package of bills that deal with public information and open government. Um, one of my bills deals with the Open Meetings Act. The Court of Criminal Appeals just recently uh, uh, overturned, uh, said it was unconstitutionally vague, the Open Meetings Act, that would allow for there to be what we call walking quorums. In other words, that you could have meetings with less than a quorum of people in secret and make the decisions instead of doing it in a public setting. That bill has now passed out of committee unanimously, and I anticipate it'll be on the floor um, as early as next week. And then there are a couple of bills related to obtaining public information. The Texas Supreme Court blew a hole in our, open, in our, in our Public Information Act a couple of years ago with two cases, uh, one called the Greater Houston Partnership case, one called the Boeing case. We tried to plug that hole last session and weren't successful. Uh, this session, both of those bills have now passed out of committee unanimously. Uh, they're moving in the House as well, and I anticipate having those on the floor shortly. And the Senate has passed one of your bills that aims to improve, improve uh, the training for police when they yes. handle sexual assault and family violence cases. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that our police officers are well trained, uh, family violence, sexual assault, including having trauma-informed training. Uh, the, the course that they take has not been updated for, for several years. So best practices really are not part of that course right now. Um, as you pointed out, we passed that bill out of the, uh, off, off the Senate floor just yesterday. So um, I'm looking forward to that getting through the House. I think it'll get a good hearing over there and, and becoming law because I think it'll make a difference in, in abuse cases and in family abuse cases and in sexual assault. I know you've got a very busy schedule. Thank you for making time it's for It's my us. pleasure. Thanks for asking these questions. Lawmakers push plans to legalize CBD oil and let Texas farmers grow hemp. Now they're getting a key ally. Anything that can medically, uh, you know, take away someone's pain or relieve their tensions or whatever they're taking it for, we should use it. Why the state's conservative agriculture commissioner is weighing in and how that could give farmers a new money-making option. to let Texas farmers grow hemp and to legalize CBD oil are getting support in the Texas legislature. Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller says he's also on board. Scott Freeman spoke with Miller about the plan he has to give Texas farmers a new cash crop. You just watch. There's going to be more hemp grown than we could ever process. Sid Miller may seem like an unlikely advocate for a plant that looks like pot, but the conservative ag commissioner says he's ready for a Texas hemp revolution including open access to CBD oil. If, it, if CBD oil will help you physically, I'm, I'm for it. I mean, anything that can medically, uh, you know, take away someone's pain or relieve their tensions or whatever they're taking it for, we should use it uh, for any type of, of medical use. Miller wants Texas farmers to cash in on what's been described as a green gold rush and hopes CBD companies will pour money into the state. Not only do we want our farmers to be able to grow hemp, we want the processing facilities to be located here in rural Texas and bring those jobs to rural Texas. Texas lawmakers are considering several bills to legalize hemp and CBD, but similar attempts have failed before, with some questioning the optics of hemp, a cousin of marijuana, containing only trace amounts of THC. So little, experts say it cannot make you high. I think you still have some skeptics out there who look at this and think, you know, oh, this, this sounds like that first step toward marijuana legalization. No, 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 no. Now listen, if you're a pothead, this is not going to help you, okay? <laughs> no marijuana, no THC in the hemp. Uh, if we find it in it, uh, we have to destroy the crop. Sid Miller hasn't gone California on no, this year. No, 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 no. This, potheads, you know, don't get too excited. The House committee held a first hearing on a hemp legalization bill. No one spoke out against it. Instead, the room was packed with hemp CBD supporters. 
But Miller says it's still too early to tell if there's enough support in the House and Senate to legalize hemp this year. One person could, you know, could turn the wagon over and spill, spill the whole thing and, and we lose the legislation. But so far there's very, very little, if any, opposition. If CBD makers set up shop in Texas, Miller plans a conservative, hands-off approach. He says his agency would enforce only whatever minimum standards are set by the federal government. We'll meet the minimum requirements. We won't put any extra burden on the farmers or the processors. We don't want any extra regulation. We're not for that. But first, lawmakers must decide before hemp can take root in Texas. That was Scott Friedman reporting. The House Agriculture Committee heard testimony on three different bills to loosen restrictions on CBD oil and hemp production, but lawmakers left all three of those bills pending in committee, and there are just 49 days left in the legislative session. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.